If anything is a constant, it's change. Not to be melodramatic or anything, but this change thingy was a driving force in Doctor Who's 14th season. We'd lose a favourite companion, but gain a new fave. And we'd also see what happens when the Doctor tries to go it alone. <laughs> Season 14 would see Doctor Who not resting on its laurels after the massive success of its 13th season. Producer Philip Hinchcliffe and script editor Robert Holmes would pull back slightly on the overt references to old horror films, slightly, and add some sci-fi zing. This season would also see a set-up camp in the secondary control room, with its beautiful wood-panelled rooms and IKEA-sourced control console. It comes flat packed and only needs a sonic screwdriver to assemble. The season opens up with Mask of Mandragora, a welcome return to a pseudo-historical setting. The TARDIS inadvertently takes on a passenger with a trip to Renaissance Italy. Mandragora is an entity made up of energy that's taken on a form that humans will identify with. In this case, a sparkler left over from a birthday cake in the BBC canteen. The Doctor and Sarah get mixed up in a tale of intrigue over who will become the Duke of San Made Up. This guy wearing a wig or this guy wearing a wig. Or maybe it's just elaborate Sarah Jane Smith cosplay. You're going to hold a dance? Well, only if you don't think it's too dangerous. Dangerous? My dear Duke, you've got lots of guests to entertain. Of course you must hold a hop. Sarah will love it. Ask her. Oh, yes, just my scene. Oh, I love her knees up. There's also an underground cult who seem ready-made slaves for Mandragora to take over as part of its conquest of Earth. It's actually a fun story that's pretty well made. Just because you know Mandragora is a sparkler doesn't take away from the fact that it's actually done relatively well for a show made in a multi-camera studio in 1976. We are going to prove that the Duke Giuliano is a secret devotee of the cult of Demnos. The location filming in Port Merion in Wales, familiar to some as the same location used for the village in The Prisoner, really gives the show a much more expensive feel than people usually associate with the show in the 70s. Is it dodgy acting or masterful? No, I ain't going in there, Giovanni. Not for all the gold in Rome. I know men who've tried. They've never been seen again. Who can tell? Hand of Fear is a strange beast of two parts. The first half on Earth is really good with a creepy moving hand that's realised really well. Sarah and the Doctor find a fossilised hand in a quarry before getting caught up in an explosion. Because in this case, it's an actual quarry on Earth rather than Space Moon Zargafark that's just been filmed in a quarry. The hand belongs or belonged to the long dead alien criminal Eldrad who was vaporised 150 million years ago or around the same time that George R. R. Martin started writing A Song of Ice and Fire and who was able to possess Sarah and others. That's Eldrad, not George R. R. Martin. Eldrad must live. Eldrad must Eldrad needs radiation, so where better to get huge amounts of radiation? Well, anywhere in England, apparently. Fortunately, there's a nuclear reactor within walking distance of the hospital treating Sarah. Eldrad must live! The hand absorbs radiation and regenerates Eldrad, basing its new visage on Sarah's physical form. The doctor offers Eldrad a lift back to its home on Castria, a place long since dead and devoid of life, like Milton Keynes but with fewer roundabouts. Eldrad returns to its natural form and turns out is actually a psychotic megalomaniac rock after all. It's a fun story that starts to really fall apart once they get back to Castria. Is that Castria? It is. Very nice. Female Eldred is a fantastic creation, but it's a shame she's only on screen for about 30 minutes all up. I mean, Tom Baker's clearly been working out since she's meant to be made of stone, or perhaps he was just showing off. Well, I quite liked her, but I couldn't stand him. The lacklustre ending to the Eldred storyline is okay, because really this is about Sarah Jane leaving at the end of the story, with a bittersweet departure scene between Sladen and Baker. Don't forget me. <sighs> Sarah, don't you forget me. It's a nice ending to a character who was joined to Tom Baker's hip for so long. Of course, Doctor Who was not the only British science fiction series to be made on a small budget. Over on Thames TV, we had a long-running series about child telepaths, the Tomorrow People, which ran for eight seasons. Seems to be in a state of shock. So would you be if you'd just been rescued from space by three nuts in a rusty old van? And yes, it was later remade in the 1990s and again by the CW in the US. The Tomorrow People has aged less well than you might like. You're a robot. 
The Deadly Assassin is an all-time classic and a landmark story, unique in the classic series. Firstly, it's the only story that doesn't start or end with a companion travelling with the Doctor. It's the first time a story was set completely on Gallifrey and would become the definitive look at Time Lord society, sweeping away the aloof godlike beings we'd glimpsed on previous occasions and replacing them with stuffy bureaucrats mixed in with Oxbridge faculty tropes. It's also a complete sausage fest. Have you had a facelift? Several so far. The Deadly Assassin is directed by David Maloney from a story penned by script editor Robert Holmes, the first of two such pairings this season. It's a taut thriller with some elements that brought to mind the 1960s John Frankenheimer film The Manchurian Candidate, which for people who get confused refers to somebody from Manchuria in China, not Manchester in England. The Doctor has a vision of the President of the Time Lords being assassinated, and he returns to Gallifrey on the day the President resigns. He's not a crook, it's just part of Time Lord culture. No, not a crook. The Doctor is blamed and promptly put on trial, with the leading contender for the Presidency, Chancellor Goth, pushing for the Doctor to be executed immediately. The Doctor buys some time by invoking an arcane law as he announces himself as a candidate for the imminent presidential election. Accused murder seems as good a qualification for becoming president than any other. Suppose I can convince you I didn't do it. Now with 48 hours to prove his innocence, the Doctor and the Castellan, basically the police chief of Gallifrey, soon discover the Doctor's oldest enemy, the Master, is involved. The Master hadn't been seen since 1973, when actor Roger Delgado had died, and the current production team wanted to bring him back in a way that would act as a stopgap, keeping the character alive but not hemming in future producers. Hence, the Master is portrayed here as at the end of his final regeneration, and looked like a rejected haggis that only Asda would sell, a haggis that's passed its best before date, and had been nibbled at by the dog, again Asda. No answer to a straight question. Typical politician. Deadly Assassin was also something of an experiment. Even though he'd had an excellent relationship with Elizabeth Sladen, Baker's confidence grew the longer he was in the role, and by now felt that he didn't need a companion. All he needed was a cabbage on his shoulder to explain the plot to. What a stupendous egotist. Partly as an experiment, and partly to mollify Baker, that Doctor doesn't have a regular companion here. But as he still needs to explain the plot to someone and also to spar off, the Castellan fills that role. Either way, this story proved that you still needed somebody to explain the plot to. What is the master like on mathematics? He's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. He's almost up to my standard. What's that? Episode 3 is set almost entirely within the Matrix. It's not a computer per se, but it might as well be, since if you die in the Matrix, you die in the real world. I deny this reality. The reality is a computation matrix. I shouldn't need to say this, but as this was made more than two decades before the Wachowski films, no, Doctor Who didn't rip off The Matrix. We have a taut thriller, sparkling dialogue and excellent direction, along with outstanding set design and costumes. But then in the last 10 minutes, it all comes apart as the budget wasn't there to do much for the supposedly epic finale, since shaky cam was kind of difficult to do with the giant studio cameras of the day. It was going so well until it wasn't. If the doctor's right, the end of the world is approaching. Meanwhile, over on the Tomorrow People. I don't suppose they thought of it. These people, they call themselves the people, don't really know how to operate the ship. Trust me, this is going somewhere. Face of Evil by new writer Chris Boucher is a cracking story on a planet where the Doctor has never been to before, but somehow everybody recognises him as the Evil One. Why? That's why. The tribe of the Sever team are about to banish Leela for heresy, killing off her dad in the first five minutes. And he's mourned about as much as an M&M dropped on the floor that's then been licked by the puppy and discarded. The Sever team are in a tiz about whether to wage war on their traditional enemies, the Tesh, or whether to stay home and watch it all on telly. Leela and the Doctor strike up a friendship. Now, get your mind out of the gutter. And together they travel through the barrier to the Tesh, which turns out was just an Earth spaceship that crashed long ago, with the technicians staying behind on the ship and becoming telepaths dressed like clowns, and the survey team who live like primitives and eventually become known as the Sever team. Where's the bridge through the barrier? Up the nose? No, it isn't. It's over the teeth and down the throat. In the past, the Doctor had helped a stricken Earth exploration vessel when it was marooned in space. He had repaired the ship's computer, but unfortunately gave it his personality. So a computer that was grumpy and vindictive and married co-stars, it seems. Face of Evil is a fun story, mostly well made, but has a really interesting high concept premise. But again, the execution falls apart slightly towards the end. 
Leela, played by Louise Jameson, is easily the most unique companion in the entire history of the series. A knife-wielding warrior, she's intelligent, but obviously not educated, so the Doctor takes on a mentoring role. If you could keep that, exactly that distance away, and have it here, the large one would fit inside a small one. That's silly. The scenes with Leela trying to understand complex tasks in a way her savage mind would understand are brilliant. Why are you making fire in your mouth? And while a lot of it is due to good writing, much of the credit has to go to Jameson. When aiming for the heart, we were always taught to strike under the breastbone. Upon my soul. There's a very good reason why Jameson is possibly the only companion from the original series to go on to even better roles after her brief season and a half stint on the show. She is never less than excellent, in a role that could have easily just been eye candy. As a warrior of the Sever team, Leela probably kills more people on screen, not just monsters and aliens, but people, than any other companion in the series history, even those in unit. When the modern series likes to psychoanalyze the Doctor by portraying his past actions as mass murder, just because a villain once taunted him so, Leela lays waste to various henchmen and guards, with only the occasional rebuke from the Doctor. Who licensed you to slaughter people? Leela's introduction also marks a prolonged period that would last until Tom Baker's final story, where there were no people from contemporary Earth in the TARDIS crew. A lot of people these days decry the fact that the companions are always human from the present day and British, but the series has always had concepts that need explaining to the audience, which was the point of the companion, to be the audience surrogate and to react the way we would. Like Gogglebox in a skirt. I just want to know who you are and where I am. That was the theory anyway and one that show would ignore for four or five years. It actually worked out pretty well. Like that time you ate the whole stick of butter. Would you care for a knife or a fork? It's a good knife. Robots of Death, also by Chris Boucher, is the series at its finest. It starts off as a whodunit set on a mining vessel on a remote planet, with the human crew pampered by their robotic servants. It's a story where rather than try to go for cutting edge aesthetics on a BBC budget, they used an art deco feel, which funnily enough, dates the show far less than most of the 70s sci-fi stories. The Doctor and Leela arrive on board the sand miner just as the body starts showing up, and pretty soon it's obvious that the killers aren't human, but are in fact the very robots this civilization depends on. Would you like a jelly baby? Shut up! Simple no thank you would have been sufficient. Robots of Death is a classic, achieving what it sets out to do with a level of style we will miss from the series over the next few years, as a lot of people responsible for this season moved on to other shows, quite a few of them on the BBC's new science fiction series, Blake 7, where they rarely managed anything this stylish. Now either it followed you, or else it honed in on this. It depends which of us is going to kill that. Kill the Doctor. The season ends with another cracker by script editor Robert Holmes, and this is one of the classic series' top five serials. It's a story that, retrospectively, has acquired an air of controversy. Talons of Weng Chiang sees the Doctor and Leela visiting Victorian London's East End, becoming embroiled in a web involving missing women somehow linked to a Chinese illusionist performing in a theatre. Lee Sen Chang is the servant of the god Weng Chiang, and is kidnapping women so that his injured master can extract their vitality to regenerate himself. The Doctor and Leela team up with theatre owner Henry Gordon Jago and coroner Professor Lightfoot. You'll be the sufferer when the police get here. <laughs> the police? Did you hear that, Mr. Sin? They take me for a simpleton! And it's an almost perfect adventure trading on the tropes of Jack the Ripper, Sherlock Holmes, and General Victoriana. The serial ends up being a game of cat and mouse over who is holding onto the giant strepsil. But let's not ignore the elephant in the room, but instead talk to it, and listen to its concerns about the ivory trade. While there are a lot of minor Chinese characters in this story, only one Chinese character has a major speaking part, and that's played by actor John Bennett, obviously not East Asian himself, but he's wearing yellow face makeup. Are you Chinese? You used to see three or four East Asian actors working in British TV at the time, but there was obviously not a huge pool of talent to draw from. Which is a fair enough argument, but I don't think people involved with the production were too concerned one way or the other about representation. It wasn't the first time a Caucasian actor played an Asian character in Doctor Who. People would obviously lose their minds if Marco Polo was ever found. Because your need is so great, 
I've been forced to move unwisely. Bennett, however, does play the character quite well and sympathetically in a serial full of great performances. Asian stereotypes aside, and a relatively accurate depiction of casual 19th century racism that goes unchallenged, no one seems to care about the appalling Cockney stereotypes on show. They are clearly unrealistic, since, as modern television has taught us, at no stage is anyone in this forcefully asked to leave one's pub. You and Mama served with the onions. Never seen anything like it in all my puff. Oh, make it all sick, that would. Back on The Tomorrow People, they apparently had little trouble casting Asian actors when required. In fact, the show was a model of diversity in the 1970s and... Ah, shit. Inside Mr. Sin is actor Deep Roy, better known as the Oompa Loompa in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The man they were carrying was dead. He had been stabbed through the heart. Really, miss? And how can you be sure of that? I am a warrior at the Sever team. I know the different sounds of death. Now put our prisoner to the torture! There's that other elephant in the room, the deadly dragon ray gun, that can demolish a wooden table in a mere 45 minutes. If you try to use it, it'll probably explode in your face. Explode? I think it was made in Birmingham. While it's not an elephant itself, you can't overlook one particular fault of this story. It has a giant rat, and it looks about as realistic as a vehicle emissions figure supplied by Volkswagen. The Muffin Man. Come on, I'll buy you some muffins. Talons was the last story to be overseen by producer Philip Hinchcliffe, a man who made it his mission to lift the game of all concern with making the series. The following year would see a new producer and a move away from the gothic horror tone that had defined the series in the mid-70s. And the Doctor would get a dog. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.